in that order. Before all of that, talking through today's top stories with Isla and Alan Johnson. Good to have you both here. Who are matching today? Hello. Yeah, yeah, we coordinated. Yeah. Oh, I, I texted yeah. her last night. Were you two on the blower last night? As well? <laughs> yeah. Are you doing black? Are you doing black? Well? <laughs> Good to see you both. Good I've missed you. I've seen you, I know, I know. Alan, nice to see you again. Good to see you. Yeah. Okay, let's start off with breaking news, obviously, in mm. Taiwan. Uh, one of the biggest earthquakes in 25 years. Uh, it's a magnitude of 7.4. I mean, mm. these these yeah. um, pictures are just unbelievable to, yeah. to look at. Um, yeah. You're saying nine dead at the moment, but obviously that's... Yeah, really they're, st they're still searching for days. 77. Um. It's, it's basically caused buildings to fall, landslides and nearly 50 aftershocks. I mean, I, I don't think I've ever seen anything quite like this, Alan. Well, the largest, as I understand it, on this kind of Richter scale, the biggest earthquake ever was 8.6. Mm -hmm. This is not wow. far off of that. Mm -hmm. So it's not just the biggest in Taiwan for 25 years, it's mm. one of the biggest. I mean, look how they're going the up world. the stairs, Lee. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Like that. Uh, and sadly, the death toll is likely to rise. They are still searching for, I believe, about 77 people. There's about 700 injured. But the epicentre was actually 11 miles away from the biggest city. So it could have been a lot worse. And those who died were actually on a hillside. Um, a few of them were hikers, and it was through landslides that they that they died. So, um, is there going to be some warnings with regards to tsunamis? With regards there was to a warning, mm. but they've withdrawn that now. Okay. So, yeah, that's as, that's as okay, much well, as we know. Okay, well, with everyone out I'm going to put you on the spot. But obviously, you know, you've you've sort of you know, worked in the highest offices in the country. So, what happens? What do we do when something like this happens? Is there much we can do other than offer help to the government over there? No, and expertise. If we've yeah. got the expertise, depends where it is. Taiwan are very expert at dealing with these things themselves, unfortunately. And the voluntary sector is really important. There was an organisation, a charity, I think still exists, that used to go out from Britain mm. to these places. And, you know, people like firefighters and shop assistants would just drop everything mm. uh, to go there and help to to clear the rubble and to save people's lives. Well, it's obviously sending our thoughts and prayers to all those involved. Um, and doesn't get any better. Three British yeah. workers uh, killed uh, in the Israeli aid strike. Workers. Aid workers, yeah. Um, also, other victims, Australian, Polish, Palestinian uh, and a US-Canadian mm. citizen. I always um, never really like saying where people are from. You know, yes. human life is human life. But I guess this just mm. brings it closer to home. John Chapman, James Henderson and James Kirby are among seven charity workers. Uh, for the World uh, Central Kitchen killed a Monday strike, um, uh, an Israeli strike in Gaza. Um, I'll start with you. I mean... Well, yeah, as you say, the reason why we're talking about it is because there are Brits, but sadly, this is not a one-off incident. Yeah. Um, there has been 196 aid workers killed during the Troubles, and, of course, 30,000 in total is the death toll. What is so alarming about this, and there is an investigation, there were three vehicles. Some of them were, I think, sorry, the furthest away, they were a mile apart. They were targeted by drones. They have one of the most sophisticated militaries in the world. So someone's, I believe it's three people would have to give permission for these strikes to happen. It's gone right through the logo. Now, this logo is really important. So aid workers there, they have to basically let the Israeli authorities know we are going from A to B and these are our vehicles. This was That's a organised, really it's very specific. They're wearing flak jackets. They were picking up um, some of the aid from, the, there's a, a marine route that's coming in. Um, they would picked up one of the shipments and they were on their way and that's when it happened. But worse than that, the first vehicle was struck. They put injured people into the second vehicle. Then the second vehicle was struck. So there are more than questions to be answered in investigations. This is, you know, I mean, it's just demonstrative of the, the disaster that's going on there. And, and even worse is, you know, 240 tonnes of aid that was sitting in a boat waiting to get taken in to these starving people. That's had to go back to Cyprus because the aid workers are saying, we, we will not do any more until we are guaranteed our safety. And this so is So aid has been suspended yes, for the time yes. being. I mean, this is a knock-on effect, isn't it? The fact that the aid has been suspended, yeah. people are suffering out there. I mean, not forgetting all the people who have already been killed, yeah. the Palestinians yeah. who have been killed World already. Central Kitchen were providing hundreds of thousands of meals mm. in a country where it's got a population of 2.2 million. The estimate is half of that population will be in famine. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so it was a crucial contribution. It may never return. But I think we were talking earlier on about what happens when a disaster like Taiwan happens. Mm -hmm. what, happen, what happens when something like this happens 
is politicians have to reach for the right language. I think mm. our Prime Minister and our Foreign Secretary got the language right. Appalling, which is a strong word in the world of diplomacy, was the word the Prime Minister used, which is appalling. The reaction of Netanyahu, the Israeli Prime Minister, I think was totally inadequate to mm. say things like this happen in war. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's true, but for all the reasons that Isla just said, mm. this is a sophisticated military yeah. operation. The Israeli Defence Force was warned about this. They were clearly marked. Mm. This, is an, this is a bit more than, oh, these things happen in war. Alan, you're right. Words obviously matter. And sorry to sort of ask you again, but obviously, you know, you, you have a lot of experience in this field. So, how much, how much can a government, our government, irrespective of, of what political parties involved, criticise the Israeli government in, in the wide scheme here, given that we seem to be taking our lead from America and the UK, since 2008, the UK's licensed arms worth over £574 million to Israel. So, what language does matter. So, you know, how, how, what, how, how heavy-handed, I suppose, can... Rishi Sunak and David Cameron be with the Israelis, or do they have one hand tied behind their back because of our relationship with America? Well, their allies, uh, Israel's greatest ally is America. We were fundamental in setting up the state of Israel. You only have to look at what happened on the 7th of October last year to see why Israel needs to be able to defend itself. The people that were oh, no murdered, one's over that. a thousand people. Well, no one's questioning it, but there's a hundred hostages being held. This could be over tomorrow mm -hmm. if Hamas released the hostages. Agreed. So when, to kill so when 30, you see... To kill yeah, 30,000 yeah. no, no, for but, 100. Uh, hang on, but, the, but the question is what happens in terms of their allies. Mm. Yes, we provide arms to Israel, because what Hamas wants to do is to wipe Israel off the face of the earth, is to just totally eradicate the country of Israel. Sorry. Sorry. So, of course, <laughs> as allies, we defend Israel. Yeah. So that's why language is very important. When you talk about heavy-handed, it's, it's crucial for Israel to have America as a strong ally. Less crucial but important to have the UK and the European Union as strong allies. And when your allies are concerned about something and express that concern strongly, as we have, it does matter. It does have a diplomatic effect. Do you think? So what's well, so upsetting for me, Isla, I was just mm. thinking, if you're saying that the UK has licensed arms worth over £574 million to Israel, that... Yeah. That bomb. could be. That we could. could be, yeah, we, we could, could have supplied yeah. that bomb that's killed. I, I agree with what you're saying about language, but I think actions. Action has to be taken, and if we stop the pipeline of arms now, America is by far the biggest arms supplier, but we have a part too. And there are calls this morning that Britain, you know, would basically have a ban on sales of arms to Israel. Um, Netanyahu is murdering people. Um, he has been... We've, we've, I've sat here so many times saying, you know, is this a war crime? They're going to have to analyse it. And the, the politicians are not allowed to declare that it has to be done by the, the judges and the lawmakers around the world to, to determine that. But I think he's just... He is getting away with murder. Sorry to use that phrase, but it's true. And he'll, I think more needs to be... He'll done. be out of office. That's one of the problems here. While the war's going on, the Israeli people are obviously concerned about the war effort. When it's yeah. over, Netanyahu will be voted out of office. You... There's nothing more certain than that that will happen. The people who are running Hamas will never be elected out of office. Two-thirds two to three-quarters of Israeli people want Netanyahu out. Yeah. But in order for him to be, the, whatever it is, a no vote of confidence or for the, the government to get him out, they have to have people within their own party to do that, and they're not going to do that, because if they do that, they know they're not going to win the next election. Uh. So a small... It's only five people in their government that need to say, yeah, we want him out in his party. They're not going to do that. It's huge protest in Israel as well. Yeah. Uh, mm. Against yeah, yeah. In the yeah. last couple of days. Let's uh, talk about Ofsted and the fact that four in five teachers say we should act... Ofsted now, uh, a survey of 4,500 teachers in, in, in the English state schools by the National Education Union found that four in five of them think that the current Ofsted mm. uh, system just really isn't working. Alan? Well, this um, goes back to the tragic suicide of Ruth Perry. Yeah. <clears throat> and it isn't working. And one of the reasons it isn't working is this one word description yeah. that goes from mm. outstanding so at the bad. top yeah. to inadequate at the bottom. It's very bad. I've seen schools in my constituency turn from outstanding to inadequate virtually yeah. within three terms, and that doesn't give you a lot of yeah. confidence in the system. So it needs to be looked at. Not eradicated. There needs to be some uh, 
some method for parents and children. Ofsted isn't there for teachers. It's there to judge the standards in education. Mm, yeah. I brought my kids up on a council estate in the 70s, my big kids, when you couldn't get into schools. It was a closed shop for parents. Yeah. You, you, you knew nothing about what the school was doing. You just wanted the to get your child into a school. No. You just wanted to get them into a school. Yeah. So knowing how well the school is operating, know how, knowing how competent they are at educating your children is really important. So there needs to be some kind of inspectorate there. But I think this question of, uh, uh, of, of how they classify the schools is a very legitimate issue. Yeah. How would enough. that change, do you think? Like, how could they make that more... Like, More nuance, yeah. just so that... So, I mean, there's an issue about the pressure and the way that Ofsted conduct these inspections, yeah. which, which mm -hmm. the Ruth Perry case brought to light. Mm -hmm. But also, you can... I mean, you cannot just say that this school is outstanding and a school down the road, which have got the same kind of problems, social economic mm -hmm. problems, the, the, the children that are coming to the school have all kinds of problems that they bring to school with them. You can't just judge one as outstanding and one as inadequate. Yeah. And that's the end of yeah. it. There has to yeah. be more nuance to that. Yes, the, the, I agree. And, and the system is actually creating so much stress on these teachers that yeah. it's actually impacting the quality of their work. So it's defeating the purpose. They're getting so stressed out about these inspections because so much is riding on it that it's, it's damaging the quality of teaching. So you could be an outstanding school, but you're so stressed out, you're going to become inadequate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So interesting. Uh, thank you, you two. Thank you. Uh, stay with us. Ida and Alan are discussing more of today's headlines after the break, including the Chinese takeaway, which is getting sassy by unhappy customers for giving them bad reviews. And he's here. He's starring Guy Ritchie's smash hit TV series, The Gentleman. Daniel Ings, he's joining us on the sofa to tell us all about that famous chicken dance. And hopefully, he might do the chicken dance. <laughs> no, he's not going to do the you chicken dance. You never know. We'll be back right after this. <laughs> <laughs>